Okay. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. So thank you for joining this very special Alumni Weekend edition of our MAPS Evening Perspectives author series. We're sort of shifting it for uh, the time for Alumni Weekend. But um, my name is Amanda Hirsch, and I'm a 2004 graduate of the MAPS program. And I have to say that the program absolutely changed the way that I view the world, and, and it certainly enriched me. And um, to this day, I use the critical thinking skills and the unique insights that I learned during my time in MAPS. The only thing it didn't prepare me for is a virtual platform, clearly, because I had a lot of things <laughs> today. <laughs> Um, but just a little background, since graduating, I've worked in political consulting, and then for a while, I worked on Congressman Mike Quigley's uh, congressional staff in his Chicago district office. And uh, that led me to yeah, sort of indirectly um, the MAPS Alumni Association. I wanted to get back to sort of that rigor and, and the ideas that, you know, we all share those conversations. and. It's, it's just an amazing, talented, diverse alumni community, which is a great reflection of the program itself, I think. Um, and it's very lively. And I'd like to give a shout out to Kate Austin, who is our fearless leader. <laughs> and she does a fantastic job of leading the board for us. So just a few housekeeping items. Hop in is a new platform so thanks in advance for your patience if we have any issues with this um, you can post your questions in the group chat and after our speakers are done then we'll have a q a after the presentations and then after that we'll have a book raffle before we close out the call so my other moderator today is marika stoll and she's a fellow alumni board member so marika yeah, and as, as we just discovered, uh, David and I actually graduated the same year, 06, not to age ourselves too much. Um, but yes, my name is Marcus Stahl. I am a research associate and postdoctoral fellow at Uni Indiana University, Bloomington. And um, I definitely enjoyed my time in MAPS. And I now that I have John here, I want to say thank you again, John, for helping me so much with uh, when I was applying to graduate schools with MAPS and John's help, I was able to get into four graduate schools, got into uh, a really great one, the University of Arizona, and after persevering through financial collapses and all the dry funding, I finally graduated with my PhD, and like I said, yes, and now a postdoctoral fellow, so uh, MAPS definitely made a huge difference in my life, and I'm happy to give back by serving on the alumni board. So uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. We will be doing our Q&A at the end, and also, like Amanda said, we will be raffling off some books. So please do stick around. And now I'm going to toss it back to my other lovely moderator. <laughs> Okay, so again, welcome to anybody who's just joined us. And in reference to everyone's favorite rigorous core MAPS course, we've developed this Hallmark Lecture Series, which is Evening Perspectives for the Intellectually Curious, which incidentally has served us well as we've made this transition to virtual events over the past year <laughs> um, to keep us all connected. And Tonight's topic is two perspectives on sports community and the pandemic. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our headline speaker, 2006 MAPS alum, Dr. David Truey. And I have his bio right here, which is really interesting. Um, so Dr. Truey is an associate professor of sociology at James Madison University. He specializes in qualitative methods with research and teaching interests in international migration, labor, community, and leisure. His first book, Football in the Park, Immigrants, Soccer, and the Creation of Social Ties, examines the vital role of play and public parks in developing social connections in the city. He is currently researching H2A agricultural guest workers in Virginia. So David, thank you for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you. And they give me one moment as I uh, get this figured out. All right. You should be able to see my screen right now. 
as I do with my students, thumbs up. All right, perfect. So let me uh, so let me begin. I have a, a brief presentation here, and uh, then really excited to turn it over uh, to Professor McAloon and uh, a conversation with fellow alumni. Uh, so again, uh, thank you uh, to Maps and Amanda for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm forever grateful to the Maps program, you know, for providing me with the skills and ambition to launch a career in academia. Um, you know, I wasn't ready. Uh, after undergrad, which is probably why I didn't get into a single PhD program on my first try, uh, and the MAPS program provided an ideal springboard uh, from one stage to the next. Uh, I know many alumni, uh, MAPS alumni, turn faculty with similar debts of gratitude. Uh, I hope the uh, program continues to prosper. Alumni network is an important part of this process, uh, as we all know. So thank you again for organizing this event and others. And I think we're all most excited uh, to hear from our beloved no nonsense Professor McAloon. Um, so today's talk is uh, with John, if you may, uh, is a long time coming, uh, specific to today's event, 2005, when I entered the MAPS program. But the story of my book Football in the Park, Immigrants, Soccer, and the Creation of Social Ties goes much farther back in time to when I was a child playing soccer in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, if you'll pardon the indulgence, um, <laughs> where are we at? Can you see the pointer on this? I don't, yeah. I don't know how this is. Okay, perfect. So if you'll pardon the indulgence, I'd like to share a photograph of a team I played on for in 1990 as it speaks to what brought me to this point today with John. So that's me right there, around 11, year old, 11 years old, smiling wild, uh, widely right uh, behind John's son right here, Jono. Uh, so I spent much of my childhood playing soccer with Jono and others in the photo. And this team, Pele Stars, has its own interesting history as the first predominantly white but multiracial competitive youth soccer team in Evanston, which shows how much the game has grown in the past three decades. If you'll spare some further indulgence, many of these boys, unfortunately I was gone by then, in the photo went on to play second in the state their senior year of high school, roughly six or so years later. Uh, so these early experiences that continue to this day as I'm now one of the old guys on the team, instilled a profound interest in the game's ability to provoke such strong emotions, deep friendships, and varied opportunities that can transcend, transcend but also reinforce social differences. I'm sure, as I'm sure we'll talk about more today, we've all gained a deeper appreciation for the role of sports in generating entertainment, identity, and community through its absence and now reemergence during the pandemic. I brought a personal and intellectual interest in sports to the University of Chicago, and under John's generous and astute mentorship, I wrote my MAPS thesis. Um, let me figure this out. Uh, so my MAPS thesis, something that probably makes us all shudder just thinking about, uh, on the history of ethnic soccer teams and leagues in Chicago, which I eventually published in the journal Soccer and Society. At UCLA, I continued to explore the relationship between soccer, ethnicity, and immigration, but focused my attention in the present day on a group of predominantly Latino immigrant men who gathered in a West Los Angeles park to socialize and play soccer. I first arrived at the Mar Vista soccer field here located uh, on the map just east of Venice and Santa Monica by the 405 freeway after my professor told me about some of the neighbors that were upset about all the activity on the recently installed turf soccer field. That the users of the field were primarily working class Latinos and the surrounding neighborhood was largely white and upper class piqued my interest. However, my attention quickly shifted to the pickup soccer games in the park. Even if the neighborhood concern served as an important backdrop to the story I came to tell about the social world of the park. Although only one of the chapters deals directly with soccer playing, as the title suggests, soccer or football uh, is what draws and connects the men to a park in West Los Angeles. It is a game uh, most of the Latino immigrant men brought with them from their home countries and that served as the basis for forming relationships and reclaiming a sense of self in their new home. Despite the perception of stable hometown connections, many of the, met, many of the men met as strangers in the park. 
and it is through soccer that other engrossing park activities unfolded, namely beer drinking, storytelling, and the occasional fight. And it is also through soccer that significant outcomes emerge, primarily the exchange of work-related resources and referrals. Before turning to what I hope is an open-ended discussion about, about my book, John's work, and your own experiences with socializing and playing sports in public parks, I'd like to show a brief video of Park Life one of the men in the book texted me a few years after I left Los Angeles. For my book attempts to capture the camaraderie, the creativity, the coordination revealed in this video that is often missing from the more one-dimensional portraits of Latino immigrant men. From the video still, you begin to get a sense of what this world was all about, playing soccer and drinking beer. But with time, I saw how both activities were more about being together in a way that resonated with the men's interests and biographies and aligned with the rest of their lives. And it is through these mundane, but at times invigorating and joyful interactions that they built relationships, gain recognition and exchange resources. But so much more is revealed when we press play. And hopefully this works on this platform. So hopefully the sound it, it uh, came across and happened. So although some of the details are hidden from you, I'm guessing I, I could see John smiles there. I can make out over uh, over Hopin or whatever the platform we're working on here uh, that this scene feels fun and entertaining. You might also sense how the men make their interactions dramatic and meaningful through their exuberant displays and playful taunts. Indeed, the book's central argument is that fun with others, what sociologists refer to as sociability, is not automatic but takes work and collaboration. What you watched was an achievement built on group history and the demands of the situation. For example, there's the ritual of playing soccer and gathering afterwards to socialize and drink beer. And the park provides a space to do that although it's far from neutral or trouble-free, as the men's time there sometimes created conflict with neighbors, police, and family members. The park draws a revolving cast of characters that energize the proceedings. In this case, two cherished regulars juggling the ball, beers in hand to the delight of onlookers, eager to applaud and berate. You, you also see how the men draw from a local history to spice up the fun namely Polo's declining form and Ivan's ascendancy to galactico status. The men's confidence and creativity also come alive, be it Ivan's playful Cientaco's nicknames for his hearty appetite or Polo's willingness to play the fool. Taking together, this video provides a peek into the men's complex humanity, contrary to more one-dimensional portraits of Latino immigrant men that saturate the airwaves. Watching the video transports me back to the park and similar scenes I try to capture in the book. There we go. I now like to share two photographs that are not in the book. Football in the park captures a moment in time and one filtered by my own biases and experiences in the park. Furthermore, social worlds are never static, but constantly evolving. Someone I met at a previous book talk sent me a wonderful photo from his time at Mar Vista, the park, while he was a graduate student at UCLA in the 1990s, well before I initiated this project. The photo captures a recognizable scene from the park, a group of men cheerfully posing on a picnic table before or after a game of soccer. I believe I know some of the men in the photo and heard many stories of park life from this period, but the meaning and history of this particular moment in time is unknown to me. I imagine many of you have your own photos and rich memories of playing and socializing in parks as well. Indeed, that is the promise and possibility of informal play in public space, which you might have rediscovered during the pandemic. Football in the Park is my attempt to capture the meaning, organization, and history of this familiar global scene that many people only glimpse from afar through the prism of narrow stereotypes. In fact, outsiders tended to perceive and represent the situation on and off the Mar Vista soccer field as unruly, even dangerous. And I'm guessing many of the people on this call have seen Latino immigrant men, of course, playing uh, soccer in public space as well. 
The second photo celebrates the culmination of a project that began in January 2008. In mid-January of this year, when the book came out, Polo, one of the main characters in the book, texted me this photo of him holding my book with a group of guys standing in the very same parking lot as the previous photo. Seeing my book out in the world in Polo's hands warms my heart for my book aimed to honor how Polo and the other jugadores del parque, which is a term, the park players that they use to refer to each other, imbue their lives with meaning by coming together to play soccer and socialize in a public park. For the men I describe in my book are not one-dimensional caricatures deserving sympathy or scorn, but people living full and complex lives amid challenging circumstances. Indeed, as I mentioned, while it was neighborhood grievances that had originally drawn me to the park, it was the soccer players themselves who captured my attention and who deserved to be brought out of the shadows. Let me conclude with a few lessons for anyone thinking about socializing, uh, about people socializing and playing sports in public parks. So again, this is kind of geared towards other academics, but again, this is just about anybody thinking about uh, what it means to socialize and play sports in public parks, at least to think about it. So first, and I think this is something John instilled at me from uh, day one at MAPS, is informal play in all its wholesome, obscene forms are to treat them as important in its own right, rather than frivolous, beyond the pale, or proxies for something else. I came to this project in part because there had been so little written about Latino men playing soccer in public parks, despite its ubiquity in cities small and large. I'm guessing most of you have some experiences with Latino men playing soccer in parks. Um, I believe my book shed light, sheds light on the inner workings of this familiar scene while also speaking to other is issues such as network formation and immigrant reception. Second, I urge you to situate worlds of play within the context of participants' histories and everyday lives. It took time and patience, but I gained greater insight into what I was observing at the park by going beyond its boundaries. So to my surprise, I saw how the park emerged as the safest and most respectable place to drink beer and occasionally fight, which revealed underlying structural inequalities, especially because the neighbors were wondering why do they need to drink beer in the park? Uh, and by following the men at work, I saw how they were welcomed as workers in ways they weren't always as people in the park. Indeed, many of the neighbors relied on Latino immigrant men and women uh, to do work in their homes. A different book would have explored in greater detail how park life connected to the men's family and home lives. Third, while surveys and interviews can reveal a lot, these more distance and short-term uh, approaches miss what only deep, long-term engagement can uncover. By spending years in the park, and again, a lot of people wondering what I was doing all day, drinking beer and playing soccer, uh, and shadowing the men elsewhere, I saw how friendships faded and flourished newcomers transformed into regulars, events lived on in story form, and routines changed and solidified over time, all of which I've tried to capture in my book. I'm now applying these lessons learned to my current research on agricultural guest workers. I'm in the midst of an ethnographic study of the men you see in this photograph, posing in front of their temporary home in Northwest Virginia after a hard day of work picking apples during the fall harvest. The men are from Mexico and holders of H-2A visas, which allows them to work temporarily on U.S. farms. I hope that this research provides a similarly humane and contextualized portrait of Latino immigrant men making a place for themselves in their new home. Thank you for listening. I welcome your thoughts and questions. And again, a heartfelt thanks to John McAloon and the MAPS program for paving the way for this book and hopefully at least one more. Let me stop sharing. There we go. Great. Thank you, David. I know we have a lot of questions for you, but we're going to hold off until after our next speaker is finished. And we are so very fortunate to have Dr. John McAloon joining us for our event today. And um, Dr. McAloon is a professor of social science in the college and emeritus director of the MAPS program. He has studied the anthropology and history of the Olympic movement and the Olympic games for over 50 years. In addition to his scholarly accolades, he has been awarded the Olympic order, which is the Olympic movement's highest honor for his diplomacy and research. 
As you will hear, he is presently preoccupied with the pandemic and human rights challenges associated with the upcoming Tokyo and Beijing Olympic Games. And I must add here that John was my thesis advisor, and um, I believe he was David's as well during your time in MAPS. Is, is that correct, John? That's correct. Great. <laughs> Marika was smart enough to avoid me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to begin by uh, uh, thanking uh, Amanda and Marika and Katie uh, for putting this together. Um, and uh, also watching Margaret Mueller this morning interview our new president at the University of Chicago, <clears throat> Margaret also a MAPS alum and now president uh, of the uh, al uh, overall alumni board, all made me think of how many years it took us and how many people contributed to really organizing a functioning, active, highly valued alumni uh, uh, association for MAPS. And so it was really, it's been really gratifying this whole day and now uh, to watch this uh, in action and uh, all the good that you do and the extreme importance to the future of the program, uh, your representation of uh, of how it has served you and uh, and how it might move forward in the future. So thank you, very moving to me, as you can imagine. Um, and also, as you already heard, um, uh, most of you I recruited to Chicago, and I promise it wasn't like David. I didn't start with you in the crib, right? I picked you up later, uh, but with him, um, it, it, it happened uh, uh, very early on. David's work, as you've seen, uh, focuses on uh, sport and society, uh, sport and culture, particularly with regard to small scale public uh, and uh, social groups, namely immigrants, um, who are often marginalized, who are often um, uh, discriminated against, who have to struggle in our urban environments simply to hold on to a place to play in the public spaces of, of the parks. My work, if you will, is at the other end of the spectrum on sport. Um, although I want you to think, and maybe uh, you might uh, ask uh, us in Q&A time, how is it that uh, marginalized Latinos in public parks and what I'm going to talk about, the Olympic Games, are part of the same continuum uh, in which sport enables the constitution and representation of social identities. At my end of the spectrum, of course, here we have high visibility, uh, a, a global demographic, a um, uh, attention from uh, uh, what probably is the highest concentration of human attention uh, in the history of our species through the mass media to single scheduled events, namely the opening ceremonies of a typical uh, summer Olympic Games. Um, and uh, that opening ceremonies having come to function really as the ritual performance of the modern world system of nation states. So sport is the draw, but it's become encased in uh, a wider uh, set of performances that attract uh, to a greater or lesser degree, world historical participation and attention and pull to it world historical issues. That's what's going on right now for me. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's uh, a, a, an irony or if it's the appropriate end to, as I near my career, uh, uh, the end of my career studying the Olympic movement and the Olympic Games, is that these uh, next two Olympic Games have really put the, uh, the whole Olympic movement in crisis. Um, <clears throat> before spelling a little bit of that out, um, let me remind you that this unfamiliar term for many of you, Olympic movement, uh, unfamiliar because our mass media don't use it. So if you're only familiar with the Olympics on NBC television, you probably haven't heard this expression. Olympic movement, but both historically and functionally, uh, uh, the Olympic system conceives of itself as a social movement. Uh, that is to say, dedicated to uh, international peace, to detente, to human dignity, 
to common humanity, human rights, uh, intercultural exchange and interaction, and hopefully education. Uh, or said uh, in, in a little bit more um, uh, 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 theoretical language, for me, what Olympism, Olympic ideology, aims to show by performing it every uh, two years is that in our world, individuality and nationality and common humanity need not be in conflict, that they can in fact coexist and indeed inform one another in spite of all the horrifying evidence uh, the murderous evidence of uh, of the 21st the 20th and now the 20 the 21st century that's my understanding of if you will the deep structure of why the olympic games uh, beyond all other kind of sports sorry david i know we have 17 days uh, and the world cup has has fewer and we have 33 sports and the World Cup only has one, but it's still the Olympic attention is is somewhat bigger. How did it come to have this? Uh, obviously something's going on beyond mere entertainment value or something to watch uh, on the television. Uh, and I believe this has a lot to do with, of course, um, this interaction between nationality and uh, individuality embodied with the athlete and common humanity uh, expressed and embodied in the Olympic symbols, the five rings, the Olympic flame and so forth. Well, we've got, if with that as background right now, the Olympic uh, movement is facing uh, two big crises. One, I think you're all aware of, obviously, you're all aware of the pandemic. And I would suspect that many of you are aware of or here in your newspapers these days, as you will increasingly over the next um, uh, the next 48 days, uh, uh, the lead up to the Tokyo Olympic Games already postponed from 2020 to July of 2021 and still very controversial in terms of whether they should or shouldn't be uh, being held. In, in Tokyo uh, this year. That's partly um, uh, as a response uh, in general to the, the pandemic and the various conditions and states of affairs with the pandemic around the world um, and in the 206 national cultures, plus a refugee team that will be uh, uh, participating in, uh, in Tokyo, at least the athletes. And secondly, uh, for interesting reasons, complicated reasons, as many of you know, Japan has been very, very much behind uh, in uh, vaccination campaign, its vaccination campaign. And it has uh, the beginnings of some new clusters, uh, particularly in cities like Tokyo that are very, very worrisome. So there's a whole public debate in the newspapers, in the sports bodies, et cetera about whether it's a good idea to go forward. At the moment, uh, if you ask me, uh, although things can happen, uh, uh, I think there's no question that the games will go forward in July, but in highly restricted fashion. The IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and the Japanese government, now of LDP party, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Suga, uh, are committed to moving forward, but under some extremely restrictive conditions. Um, while vaccination will not be required, it's estimated that between 80 and 90 percent, uh, firmly estimated, expected, of athletes and their immediate uh, coaches and entourages will be vaccinated when they arrive in, in Japan. We're talking about uh, 11,000 athletes, possibly 4,000 um, support personnel, coaches, trainers, uh, 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 medical personnel, et cetera. And then a certain number, greatly reduced, of journalists and broadcasters. Um, most of the broadcasting operations now do not require large numbers of people on site. Much of what you, uh, when you listen to the games, you hear and see uh, on NBC is actually being um, uh, uh, covered from uh, uh, from Connecticut and New York these days. 
So the numbers of uh, broadcasters uh, themselves will be highly reduced. The athletes and their immediate uh, coaches and officials will be more or less in a bubble in the Olympic Village and, of course, repeatedly tested and so forth. As you may know, there, there are no uh, foreign uh, spectators uh, going to be allowed into the country. And Japan is highly restrictive on any foreigners coming into the country and has been for some time during, uh, during COVID. Um, it's not been publicly announced yet, but it seems to us extremely likely that there will be no on-site Japanese and Japanese resident spectators at the games either. That could change, but uh, it's probably not going to. So it looks like the first um, uh, Olympic Games, Summer Olympic Games, that will be entirely a television and an internet uh, Olympic Games. Um, so proceeding under this kind of uh, restrictive uh, bubble, uh, it gives uh, 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 the organizers hope that uh, the games can go forward safely. At the same time, there are not a few skeptics on that front and uh, uh, a considerable public opinion in Japan that is scared. Now, part of you with your anthropological training understand that this is a little bit culturally overdetermined. Uh, as you know, Japanese uh, 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 culture it has a kind of structure to it that is for a long time been fearful of, shall we say, infections by outsiders. Uh, and this is adding to the, the climate of this uh, disease. We can talk about any dimension of this that you like. I would just make two points. I think what's so disappointing about our, uh, our, our, our mass media and much of our public discussion is how little it understands about the athlete's point of view and why the athletes um, uh, want this to move forward. And, uh, and secondly, uh, that the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, for whatever other interests it has, whether that's sponsorships, whether that's media coverage, whether that's local sport development, et cetera, its chief commitment, and I know the IOC members, I'm an ethnographer, I try not to talk about people I've never met and things I've never seen. Um, their chief commitment, and they take it as a moral commitment, is to mount an Olympic Games for the athletes. The larger hope is that if this is successful, it becomes a kind of ritual performance or divination for the world that says, look, we can get back to normal. We're coming through this pandemic. We'll be okay. Humanity is going to be safe again. Well, that's Tokyo in, uh, in 48 days. 11 months from now, we have a whole other issue. We have a Winter Olympic Games in Beijing in 2022, next, uh, next winter. And here the trauma is not the pandemic, which we all share and which we all uh, uh, want to uh, uh, succeed in overcoming. Here the trauma is hosting an Olympic Games in a country which is simultaneously committing genocide on its own citizens. Uh, as I'm sure uh, most of you know, uh, over a million uh, Uyghur and other Turkic speaking peoples have been in concentration camps and forced labor camps uh, for no other reason than their ethnicity and their religion. And uh, there's hardly any disagreement anywhere uh, that the documented practices in these camps, together with the destruction of mosques, together with the, uh, uh, with the forbidding of every element from dress uh, to Uyghur language uh, in Xinjiang province, uh, constitutes an ethnocide. And more and more people, including the, the formal statements of the U.S. government, increasing evidence of forced sterilization, for example, is that this, by the United Nations conceptions, uh, uh, meets the standards for a full genocide. As a consequence, what to do? Are we to host, have an Olympic Games in a country committing uh, genocide? Remember that when Berlin happened in 1936, Hitler had relatively recently taken power, and uh, of course, what was to come uh, was at that point 
uh, unknown and largely unimaginable to, to, to many people. This is different. This is in the middle of, of a known uh, genocide. Uh, those who say, well, the IOC should simply move the games, that's impossible. It can't be done. There's no other place to go. And the IOC's commitment is, look, we got to have a Olympic Games for the athletes. The larger uh, uh, public commentary now of what to do about this is boycotts. Not athlete boycotts, but rather economic and diplomatic boycotts. This is the position, for example, taken in our country uh, by Mitt Romney, uh, Senator Romney, who has a special cachet in this because he was the chief of the Salt Lake City Winter Olympic Games, who says, look, we can't, we can't and shouldn't attempt to interfere with the athletes going and competing. At the same time, uh, all the other dimensions of participation should be boycotted uh, because of the genocide. And this is a position that is being spread uh, more and more across the world with human rights groups, uh, with uh, increasing number of legislatures. At the same time, of course, as you can imagine, China is pushing back. And when I say China, I mean the Chinese Communist Party and President Xi are pushing back in every uh, possible uh, way they can. Perhaps what's most disappointing and most upsetting is that the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, has so far at least chosen to say, well, of course we respect human rights, but we also can't do anything to change Chinese government policy, uh, so we'll just go forward with the games. Um, in other words, we won't speak out. Uh, we will say nothing. We will go along as if there were not a genocide happening. And for many, that uh, means complicity. That means that the Olympic movement, far from standing for human rights, is now being deeply tarnished if this goes forward by being associated with the genocide. And the, the elites, the uh, authorities are not standing up and they're leaving it to the athletes, some of whom already have suggested their willingness, if not to boycott themselves, although I think some will, others to protest when we're there. The, the specter of having uh, the uh, uh, government haul Olympic athletes out of the Olympic village for wearing a uh, uh, Uyghur uh, uh, themed uh, uh, protest garb or gear or banners and deporting them is something that is uh, almost extraordinarily hard to compliment to, to, uh, to imagine. But that's what could and very much will happen if in fact the athletes left to their own devices with no help from the authorities, take it upon themselves to stand for human rights. And as you know, this is a widespread uh, uh, worldwide phenomenon uh, these days, as we know in this country from Colin Kaepernick and me too. So uh, we have here uh, a struggle at which I think the entire soul of the Olympic movement is at stake. Um, if things go forward, it's, uh, it's a tarnishing that will be hard, if not impossible, I, in my opinion, to recover from. At the same time, this controversy is going to turn that much more light on the Chinese Communist Party that uh, is genocide against the Uyghur and, and other Xinjiang people. So there is this paradoxical, if you will, effect, as David said earlier, of sport being a spotlight on uh, existing social relations and at the same time being used by some to kind of whitewash, varnish, get over it, uh, move past it. Uh, it's just sport, it's just play, right? And this is the amazingly complicated and interesting thing for anthropologists and sociologists like us of how this funny cultural practice sport, you know, a bunch of people running around in short pants uh, every four years or kicking a ball around a park has come to have uh, uh, across the entire uh, demographic spectrum, such a powerful, powerful uh, uh, representational and organizational uh, uh, effect on human identity and human dignity. Well, I'll stop there and look forward to your 
uh, your your questions, your comments to 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 David and me. And again, thank you so so very much for for joining us this afternoon. And John, thank you so much for being here and for those insights. I know that um, you know we've we've all kind of thought back to your lectures over the years, and um, so many things have resonated. For, for myself. Well, there, there will be there will be an examination at the end of the uh, <laughs> uh, name three perspectives that we could have used and we didn't. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm just thinking Victor Turner and Irving Goffman and all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that I, I think that you've provided an excellent complementary perspective to David's topic and the Olympic movement and uh, most of us never get a glimpse into that world. So, so thank you, um, especially with it coming up in, what did you say, 48 days, I think. It's very timely. Um, and we have, we do have plenty of time left for questions. So, yes. Rika, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Thank sure. You. I'd, yeah. And as the person in charge of the q and I'm going to be a little selfish and start with one of my own questions. Um, David, I mentioned before that my dissertation also looked at a sport called Pelota Mixteca or Mixtec Ball, uh, which is played in Mexico. And it was really funny listening to um, what you had to say about the men playing soccer in LA because there's so many parallels, uh, the camaraderie, the drinking, sometimes the fighting. Uh, but I saw on your, uh, well, your slides, it said para convivir. And one of the things uh, that a lot of the players I interviewed talked about a lot was the game is for convivencia, convivencia, which I think is excellent. Um, so what kind of was interesting to me is, um, you know, for them in Oaxaca, it's convivencia between different villages. But here in LA, it's convivencia between people from completely different countries. And I kind of wanted to hear a little more, I guess, about that, how people found, how these men found those commonalities, despite just like the wide range of experience and cultural experience they would have had coming from Peru versus Mexico versus Ecuador and, and Costa Rica, for example. Yeah, no, uh, wonderful. I, mean, I think two things. I mean, I think the, part of the commonalities was this kind of passion for soccer, passion for being together. And in a lot of ways, I found that kind of, you know, playing soccer, drinking beer was really more about a way to be together. Uh, so often the score didn't even really matter if nobody paid attention. Uh, the purpose was not to get drunk. Uh, and anyway, if you, you know, what's interesting with the apple pickers is most of them drink from big kind of 40 ounces, we would refer to, because it's more about kind of doing it kind of more by themselves, where here it was about drinking together. Uh, they would use the term toma solos, alone drinkers, were kind of ostracized because it was really more about a way to be together. And that was kind of the commonality, absolutely. So white guys would come up, show up and say, oh, I just thought it was a bunch of Mexicans. And they would realize that, no, it was much more diverse. Um, but at the same time, I think those differences were also kind of part of the fun as well. You know, I think sometimes where we see kind of things that might seem kind of xenophobic or racist or even sometimes homophobic uh, in terms of commenting on people's national differences uh, was also kind of part of the fun as well. Part of the fun is that there were Peruvians there, there were white guys there, there were African guys there. And uh, yeah, sometimes it created some hostilities but it was also what made it so exciting. And it's also, you know, part of the immigrant experience where yes, there are these ethnic enclaves and yes, uh, you know, these hometown connections are important, but part of the immigrant experience, especially in a place like LA is you can play soccer with a Peruvian. You can, and that's part of the fun that they embraced. And um, I think I have a section in the soccer chapter called playing with difference as part of the fun. No, what uh, excellent, thank you. Actually, um, we did have some questions come in beforehand from alumni, and I think this question um, is a really great follow-up to what you were just talking about. So someone asked, how do you think the pandemic has affected the sense of community created by immigrants who regularly used to meet in person? And um, what impact do you think that's had maybe on the immigrants when we have arrived in the United States just as the pandemic hit, especially now that they couldn't go outside and then form those relationships through playing soccer? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I, and what's been sad for me is I haven't been back to L.A. Uh, in a while. And, and I think so much has been lost uh, by their inability to socialize in public. I mean, I think so much of us have been suffering. Uh, you know, there's been whole thing about, you know, social distancing versus physical distances. I mean, so much is lost and we're not able to interact with other people. And, uh, you know, one of the concerns of the book was about the neighbors threatening these men's use of the park. And now it's the pandemic threatening their use of the park. And uh, my book shows how much is gained, but on the flip side, how much is lost when people don't have access to public space. Historically, it's been about privatizing space, kicking out undesirables, but now we're seeing it in terms of a global pandemic as well. Thank you. And now I guess to toss a question to John. Um, another alumni asked, um, it seems that, uh, do you think general interest in the Olympics was fading prior to the pandemic? How do you see this impacting our ability or inability to strengthen relationships within the global community? I have a, a couple of answers to that. I mean, certainly you can't make a global answer. Remember that um, in a certain way, there's no such thing as the Olympic Games. There are hundreds of them, thousands of them. There are 206 national cultures, if you allow that expression, and literally uncountable subnational cultures that to one degree or another, for one reason or another, right? It may not be so much for the sport as for the ritual forms, right? Um, that pay attention. So you can't generalize and you certainly don't wanna generalize from what's happening in your own country. Having said that, there is a widespread uh, uh, opinion, um, uh, both scholarly and by uh, the Olympic uh, authorities themselves, that sport is somehow declining in its attractiveness or interest uh, to uh, mainstream, I think this is important, to mainstream uh, Europeans and uh, North Americans, particularly among youth, right? And particularly with respect to participation, you know, not turning on the TV when you have nothing better to watch or the transformation of sport into a spectacle, except for a, you know, whoever does make the high school team. And remember, school sport is the base of our system in this country, unlike anywhere else, including Canada, by the way. Um, and uh, uh, so that there's declining commitment, except for specialized and exceptionally uh, accomplished athletes, whether in schools, clubs, all the way on up to the Olympic level. And this is a discourse in the Olympic movement. They're adding sports. You may think this is a good strategy, or you may laugh. Let's put in break dancing. Let's put in rock climbing. Let's put in surfing so we can attract the young people back because these are hip, uh, hip sports. Well, of course, what older sports officials think is hip or not may or may not uh, uh, register with real young people. Even talk now of adding esports in some fashion as, as Olympic contests. Most of the discourse attributes the lack of um, uh, or declining interest, if it exists, in quotes, mainstream, that is, say, majority um, uh, youth uh, to uh, the electronic age. Everybody's on their cell phone. Everybody's spending all their time on the Internet, including insofar as they're interested in a sport, watching, following their favorite player on social media. Nobody's playing. Well, I think this is a, uh, certainly it's a factor, but I think it mistakes what's going on in our country and many others is the radical decline across my lifetime of the opportunities for young people to play sport, right? In urban areas, especially rural areas were always a sport desert except for the schools, right? Here in the urban areas, where are the police athletic leagues? Where are the church leagues? Where are the uh, civic uh, boys and girls clubs? Where are the park 
uh, uh, programs. They are all either gone or in radical decline. All right. Counter phenomenon exists, as David pointed out, the, the, the expansion of soccer, right? The continuation of ethnic clubs uh, in Chicago area, for example. There, there are counter trends. But generally speaking, if you don't have, the, if you're not in the country club and you don't have the money to pay for the private lessons and you're not going to make the varsity, your opportunities to practice sport, many of you who are parents understand this perfectly well, are either radically declining or becoming more expensive. I think to the extent that uh, it's true that there's a declining interest, uh, this may be the case. But there are other geopolitical factors, of course. The, the height of interest in Olympic sport in certain respects was the Cold War period in, in, in the American uh, context and uh, in the civil rights movement. It may very well be that given uh, what's coming up with the Genocide Olympics are once again going to make uh, uh, sport relative uh, relevant uh, uh, to more and more people. But also there's the trivialization, which comes with commercialization and media discourse. And, oh, it's just a, a big show. It's just mm -hmm. people selling uh, Nike shoes and this that, and the other thing. And those idiots on NBC, you know, they have nothing to say that's interesting <laughs> other than you know, here's yeah. who the favorite is. And they certainly stay as far away as they can from any political, uh, cultural, religious uh, uh, discourse and interaction. In fact, they're going to have a hell of a problem with what they're going to do with uh, genocide yeah. uh, when it comes to the Winter Olympics. So we'll see. Uh, yeah. but I, I, I think the question is a very, very strong and, and correct one. Yeah, you've actually uh, <clears throat> given me a, <clears throat> a lot of food for thought and also like several different questions all related to what you said, all unrelated to each other. I'm trying to sort out what I want to ask first, but I think this is a good one. Uh, someone just submitted to the Q&A related to what you're saying about uh, sports, especially among the youth. Um, is the concept of amateur athletics now effectively, if not in fact defunct, um, maybe just dead? What implications does that have for organized sports? And I think David and John, I would like to see if both of you kind of answer that question. Well, I can do it for the Olympic side and then turn it to David to see if that word means anything in uh, in community sport, civic sport, uh, ethnic sport that he's familiar with. Yeah, that would be uh, great. The Olympic movement has not used the term amateur since the 1970s. And from the 1970s across uh, the 1980s until now, it wants the world's very best athletes. It could care less how those athletes make their money or not. As you know, tennis is in, golf is now in, NBA players, the dream team, et cetera. Uh, baseball has been both in and out because Major League Baseball will not commit and allow the best players uh, uh, to play in the Olympics. Hockey is on the edge in and out because the NHL did allow the best players to play. Uh, they proceeded to trash their Olympic villages uh, uh, a couple of times. But... Uh, uh, then it got, uh, no, I don't think we're going to. So it varies with the interactions with the professional leagues. And as David knows, and many of you do, um, soccer in the Olympics, completely important for women. It is the World Cup for women with Olympic medals, right? But not for men, because FIFA, knowing full well that if you had a World Cup with Olympic medals, their own World Cup, would decline in significance. FIFA keeps the Olympic tournament basically an age group tournament, basically with a couple of exceptions and under 23, I think David can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, tournament. So amateurism, that term means nothing at the Olympic level. David, what, is, uh, what does it resonate with, if anything, at the community sport level? And I think I'll actually speak to my personal Current experiences here. So I now live in Harrisonburg, Virginia, uh, kind of a rural uh, part of Northwest Virginia. And I'll speak of this morning. So I was on the soccer fields coaching both of my kids' teams. And uh, one of the big, so a, a pretty vibrant kind of the local club team, like the photo we saw uh, called Shenandoah Valley United. And the real big issue, you know, it's a vibrant, you know, uh, a club, uh, but the big issue is 
you know, and, and how you explain it is attracting local Latino kids to play. And uh, so Harrisonburg is a new destination. The, the, the public schools are maybe 40, 50 percent Latino. So huge population, a lot of interest in playing soccer, but they're not playing in the, the, the youth clubs. And there's a lot of different explanations for what's going on, financial, cultural uh, and so forth. But, you know, I was out on the fields today and the, the players on the field did not match the demographics of this area. And that's been a longstanding problem with U.S. soccer. Uh, it's changing, but I'm not seeing much, much differences here uh, at the local level. And it's a serious issue that I'm working on. Uh, but this morning, it was primarily white kids out on the field, uh, despite uh, the area I'm in. Um, but I will say what's interesting about amateurs. So um here in in harrisonburg it's kind of a new destination I, I don't see the same football in the park guys hanging out playing soccer openly drinking beer that i see here i don't see that as much here in part because they feel less comfortable there's more kind of intolerance uh it's changing of course uh but there is an incredibly vibrant latino men's league i'm actually there's a game right now i'm missing so <laughs> uh, and i'm still trying to hold on and play uh, because of this kind of love for the game, but they've translated it much more into an organized league game where they can reserve the fields because they feel less kind of comfortable, kind of more freely playing pickup soccer. Uh, so very, very vibrant. I mean, there's probably 50 teams in this league and very much amateur. Uh, and, uh, and we're also refugee resettlement sites. So now there's the Kurdish team, there's the Congolese team, and uh, it, it's, it's a really beautiful thing. But again, most of the white men kind of that grew up playing soccer are no longer really playing uh, kind of at my age. But in terms of the immigrant ethnic community, the amateur league is very uh, vibrant here. Um, and then another question that we have from our Q&A for you, David, um, the observations that you shared of Latinx immigrants playing pickup soccer in the park all focused on men. How does soccer as a practice inform our understanding of Latinx masculinity? And then I'd also kind of like to piggyback on that and, and ask why don't we see the women there? Or what, what, are there any women's leagues or women playing soccer? Yeah, no, that's that's a wonderful question. And uh, this, yes, this was very much a male space. There were very few women that participated in this scene. Uh, and in terms of kind of how that informs my understanding of masculinity, I mean, I think masculinity was practiced in various different ways, depending on the context. But the key insight is that, yes, this was very much a male space. Uh, very few women were involved. Now, that doesn't mean the women weren't present. Uh, they're very much present in the cell phones. They're very much present in often their unhappiness with all the time the men spent there. Uh, but and I think it also speaks to, you know, while the men were somewhat marginalized as Latino, being a man in public wasn't as much of a problem where a Latina woman would have faced different challenges being out in public. So there still are these very gendered kind of, again, it's changing differences in terms of how men and women kind of at least informally use public space, at least in Los Angeles. And, and I think that is, you know, another way that women sometimes are, um, especially, you know, Latina immigrant women in some ways um, kind of are excluded from certain interactions opportunities to build friendships and often have to do that more so in the the private realm at home or maybe more in closed spaces like churches or other organizations and i think you know and i'd be interested in the people here is we don't i haven't come across as vibrant of a pickup woman soccer scene regardless of race or ethnicity uh, and again i've seen mixed spaces but usually women that are playing soccer it's much more organized soccer uh, whether it's pick up through some kind of web meetup website or league play. Uh, and I think that might be the same for other sports as well. And I think that does speak about some gender differences in how we use and access public space. Um, <clears throat> we mentioned earlier about how would we sort of what other kind of theoretical perspectives that we would use. Uh, to analyze your guys' presentation. So I thought I would dip our toes a little bit into theory. And Amanda mentioned Victor Turner. So Victor Turner argued that modern sports are missing that liminal element. So he called it the liminoid phenomenon because they 
appeal because they're missing that ludic element. And Sharon Rowe argued instead that actually modern sports do have this ludic element because they still have that sort of uh, openness of possibly that what if situation when it comes to winning, that even with professionalization, there's still a lot of investment in time and money. And also that we still follow a seasonality of sports and that um, as Bell argued that sports do lend themselves to ritualization. So I kind of want to get your, both of your guys' thoughts on that. David, why don't you go first since we've got my, <laughs> my entire biography at stake here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I should defer to you on this actually. Uh, so you please go ahead. <laughs> no, we're laughing because as Mar Marcus did this to me on purpose. I know she did. Um, because Victor Turner was, of course, my teacher, as some of you may recall my saying in those days. And actually, I uh, uh, complained about that, uh, uh, wrote against that distinction that Turner's made in that article of the liminal and the liminoid, in which what they were trying to do, in effect, was to say, look, all of these uh, conceptions and theoretical perspectives and, uh, and notions that were developed in the context of studying so-called traditional or, or tribal or simple societies are just as applicable in the modern world, except that they're more differentiated, right? So the whole community doesn't participate in the same ritual form. The whole community isn't taken out into liminality together in rites of passage. So the genres have multiplied that we have, some people get it in the theater, some people get it in their doctor's office, some people get it at, at sports events, some people hate sport and only uh, would go to dance even though they're both silent body forms of performance, et cetera. So liminoid meant multiplicity, right? Um, not the absence of the liminal experience. Uh, what I did with that was to say, look, we can't, to my teacher, I wasn't always happy with me for doing this. So you can't understand everything is ritual, right? Yes, we have ritual in the Olympic Games, the opening ceremonies, the closing ceremonies, the lighting of the flame, the cauldron, crucially important. But we also have games, and games are not rituals, right? They have a different logic to them. We can talk about that if you're interested. And look, it's a big festival. You wouldn't know that a normal Olympic Games, obviously not going to happen in Japan or, and would never be allowed, as we saw in 2008 in Beijing, whether, believe me, there was zero public festival, um, uh, uh, much too threatening to the authorities. Um, there's this huge street festival. It's a party. And then, of course, it is a television spectacle, right? These are different things. That's what I suggested. Uh, with regard to Vic's distinction of liminal liminoid. And they're combined and recombined in different ways in the Olympic Games, right? Uh, it, but the whole thing is very, very much a kind of Van Gennepian process, right? Um, for a, a period of three weeks or every four years for the Summer Games, every four years for the Winter Games, uh, certainly for the Summer Games, there's a kind of pause in world affairs. Not this time, of course, uh, and yet it is a kind of um, experience of performative encounter on a worldwide basis with the COVID problem, right? It's a rite of healing. It may work, it may not. Many people won't think it is or isn't. They'll think it's just uh, going on because the Japanese government has committed all this money and it can't possibly cancel them or because NBC needs a product to sell or whatever. No, look, this is a, a kind of divination. It's always a kind of divination. Is the world safe enough that 200 cultures can get together and compete with one another and not kill one another? That's the normal divination ritual of an Olympic Games. And I mean that you know, very, very um, uh, directly and sincerely. That's what it is. Doesn't mean that it is that for everybody around the world. No, of course not. Um, uh, uh, and it could be weakening. 
because of the importance of the nation state representations, right? We have all this transnational labor now, including transnational athletic labor. Uh, so we could debate uh, uh, a lot about this. It's the most important question. But for me, it's, believe me, it's as, as ritual as uh, anything ever was in terms of the kinds of liminalities that are constituted. So I, I didn't um, betray my teacher. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> that, was, that was great. That was excellent. So um, that David, actually, to get... uh, Marika. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so oh. that you actually were, I don't know, maybe we're sharing a mind here on this call. <laughs> But yeah. um, I was before you asked that question, I kind of flashed back to the program when I was taking perspectives. And I remember John saying, you know, from here on out for the rest of your life, whenever you read anything, you will be able to tie uh, that a perspective to it or it will fall into some sort of uh, category. You'll recognize it. And that has happened. So, um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if David wrote from Turner's perspective, but what perspective or perspectives would you tie this book to? Um, would you say influenced it or, or to create a framework, I guess? You already mentioned one of them. Uh, uh, you mentioned Irving Goffman before. Yes, uh, all, the really, yeah. all the world stage. All the world stage. And I'm thinking so I'm of the, not, the Balinese yeah. cockfight too. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not much of a theorist, especially compared to John. And uh, uh, but definitely, as John mentioned, it was it's much more kind of drawing from Goffman. And I think in a lot of the, the big way is kind of how. So, for example, how the men made the games meaningful. The games weren't inherently meaningful in their own right. There's nothing inherently fun about putting a ball in the net. Uh, it's about the layering of the men's biography, the rituals, their identities, their culture. That's what made the games meaningful. And Goffman writes a lot about this. And you even saw it in the video uh, as the men are juggling. Yes, there's something fun about that, but most of the fun is all the, the yelling in the background that you hear, uh, that they know these men, that they know Polo is declining in form. Uh, they know. Yvonne, the one that did all the tricks, is now kind of, you know, they knew him as a little boy and he's now kind of the, the man now. And, and it's all this drama that they're putting onto this moment uh, to make it exciting, to make it interesting. And uh, what's important, I guess, as the ethnographer is the newcomer is completely oblivious to so much of this. So many people would come and say, oh, my God, why do they take this so seriously? Because they didn't understand the presentations of self going on, the ways that the people adapted to the situation to play along, to make it meaningful. You know, so I would say things like, oh, that was a great goal. Nobody saw it. It didn't matter. It was the last game of the day. Uh, and it was much more to go back to Goffman of his famous quotes, it's much more about the moment than, as he said, the men, than the people. It's really about the situation. And that's really kind of what drove, yeah. if you will, theoretically, uh, my interest in what was going on there. Yeah, and um, sort of just to add on to that, um, so my ethnography, like I said before, was with Mishtek ball players in Wapaka. And there you have another interesting layer that goes kind of on top of that because we have two different kinds of game arrangements. There's the three games that occur on Sundays. So what they call games of, of promise or games of compromise where captains will call each other and set up a game between two teams from different villages. And when what's added on to that is this idea of what they call calidad moral or moral quality, where if you don't show up, for the game, um, because usually what they do is they place bets. Like gambling is a huge part of this sport. And if you didn't show up, you forfeited your prize. But you also lost your calidad moral, your moral quality. And then other teams would not invite you for future games or future tournaments. So there's a, 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 an additional layer of this whole idea of reciprocal obligation. So they're not only called Vivencia and the love shown between hosts and guests. There also is the idea that if I give you an invitation to play, and you come to my village, I will host you, and then I will expect uh, an invitation in the future to my team. And if you don't invite me, well, you've just shown me bad face, and that's also a loss of moral quality there. So it's kind of just interesting how 
these sort of like systems work and how sports lend themselves into it so easily. And then the it's not just like meanings added on to that moment, but these moments also stretch out into the past and to the future, especially when you add on these layers of like these, these, these uh, arranged games. There's also a hierarchy of layers, which is really important to point out. I mean, if you want to say, and I, I, I mean this with, with uh, full respect, uh, David's work is on low performance sport, meaning, as he said, the, the, the social envelope is far more important than whether the ball mm -hmm. goes in the, the net or not. Mm -hmm. Whereas what I work on is high performance sport, not for everybody, but for the elite, right? In which the social part is for athletes, not only minimized, it's usually suppressed. High performance athletes, the world around them exists that they can't have a social life, that they're totally uh, committed to, preoccupied with, and I mean this literally, sacrificed. I mean that literally, blood sacrificed, bodily sacrificed to the sport, right? And uh, we always say, you know, mamas don't let your kids grow up to be high performance athletes. Athletes, yes, high performance, no. So it's always important for particular actors what precisely is the, the, the normal hierarchy of the emphasis of these layers, Marika, that you're talking about. You know? uh, and uh, it can be, and you know, liminality has its dark forms. And uh, as we know, for example, with the gymnastics uh, uh, abuse controversies in this, in this country, and certainly with doping around the world, uh, 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 high performance sport has ugly, dark, uh, deep abuse connected with it, precisely because of the separation of, uh, uh, of high performance athletes from the normal social world, which could help protect them. Well, speaking actually of, of those scandals, um, <laughs> recently with the IOC, they were actually involved in that huge uh, bribery scandal. Um, what impact do you think that has had on uh, people's perception of, of the Olympics and the, well, the organizing I, community? I, uh, the big bribery scandal goes back all the way to 2000. It's now 20 years old. Mm -hmm. I know because I was on the executive committee of the Reform Commission that, uh, that uh, transformed the Olympic system in order to deal with that. Now, we've had two other more recent incidents. In, and I can tell you as a member of the Chicago 2016 bid committee uh, 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 against us in Rio, we now have good proof that a number of African IOC members were compromised and their votes bought uh, in favor of Rio. So it's not over. And Japan, Mr. Takeda, the head of the Japanese Olympic movement, has had to be resigned because of some chicanery there, too. So it's not completely pure. But basically, the bribery scandals have been, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I know from the inside, have been more or less uh, taken care of. And the problem for the Olympic Games at the moment is not everybody's going to bribe you to pick them as host cities. It's that no one wants to host the Olympic Games. Remember, mm -hmm. we're going to be we're going to be in Beijing uh, because it defeated uh, uh, uh Kazakhstan by four and only four votes, right? Uh, and no other uh, uh, cities were interested in bidding for those Winter Olympic Games. No one. So there's a huge crisis uh, about whether it's worth it for cities to bid. And, uh, and now we'll be done with East Asia bailing everybody out. China had to have a Winter Games because it was not going to be in second place to Japan and Korea that had already had both summer and winter. That's not going to happen with Mr. Xi and the Chinese Communist Party. Now they'll probably move on to World Cup uh, in the sports uh, world after, uh, after, these, uh, after these Olympics. So yes, that's you know, extremely uh, important um, uh, kind of factor in all this national prestige. Actually, there was uh, what is going on with the World Cup in 2022? considering the pandemic. David, that's your bailiwick. 
probably know this just kind of as a soccer fan. I mean, the big controversy is that it's happening in uh, Qatar and it's happening in the fall. And uh, but I, I assume it's going ahead as planned. Uh, uh, you know, I know the Euros are happening in two weeks, uh, so that's going ahead as planned. So I don't see why the World Cup wouldn't uh, be going ahead. I mean, they have their own host of issues in terms of that particular World Cup. Uh, but uh, but again, I'm at the I'm at the amateur pickup <laughs> level of the game. Uh, although it was great, they would bring TVs and we would watch the games in the park. And uh, I'll actually uh, answer a question I see by Sarah about you know the the next generations what country are they going to identify with and i think that's a really interesting question because part of the appeal of the park is a lot of the men would bring their sons uh mainly sons to the park to watch and then gradually play and now like ivan are you know hanging out as as fathers themselves and uh, in terms of what country they will identify I mean, i think it's really you know it's it reflects kind of the immigrant experience of being pulled in both directions i mean i think they you know, if uh, the U.S. was going to win, I think they'd be happy. If they were playing their father or their parents' country, I think they'd have a lot of dilemmas. And uh, I would probably think they would probably root for Mexico or El Salvador or Honduras. But I think at the same time, they would rally behind uh, uh, the United States as well. And uh, and what's finally what's interesting is so these men, they're born in the U.S., they grew up in the U.S., they have access to bars, you know, they went to university, they have a lot of other socialize, uh, but would still come back to the park, uh, you know, versus their fathers who had much less opportunities. And the park was really the primary place they could socialize. And that, that's something that kind of impressed me that they would still, you know, they, they also felt connected to the park, which spoke to the power of this uh, as kind of an anchor and place to be. Um, Great. Wonderful. Um... Let's see, uh, Amanda, would you like to, since we uh, are getting close to time, should we announce the book uh, uh, raffle winners? Yeah, yeah, do you want to go ahead? Do you have that list? <laughs> Click the wrong button. Okay, so we are so happy to announce these winners. Um, looks like I have something else copied for, so let me redo that. Um, Okay, so for David's book, we have our raffle winners are Kevin Nielsen, Danelle Reynolds, uh, Danelle Reynolds uh, and if I mispronounce the names, I do apologize, uh, Shahan McFadden, Carol Ingloar, and Ruth Ann Schallert Weigel. And then for uh, John's book, we have Aiko Tashida, Sarah Phillips, Joseph Marklin, Patrick McGuire, and Stephen Locatio. I will be putting your names in the chat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I got it right. I will be putting your names in the chat. Um, and of course, it didn't come out right. But <laughs> if you see your name, please get in touch with uh, the MAPS alumni board. And we will coordinate getting your books out to you. Thank you so much. And let's see, I think maybe we have time for maybe one more question. Yep, why don't we do one more? Okay, okay let's see. So I guess, hmm, I wonder should we do something serious <laughs> or something fun? Um, well, Amanda, do you have any questions? No, I have a perspective question. question. That's where. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling really okay, liberal um, today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I guess so. Someone asked John. We know that the IOC has so far chosen to say that they can't do anything to change Chinese policy, and consequently, they won't take a stand against the Uyghur genocide. What is their rationale for taking this stance, given its contradiction with the Olympic movement's dedication to international peace? the Atomic Community Humanity Exchange interaction. Yeah, look, uh, it's total hypocrisy at the moment. Now, it's driven by, uh, it's driven by the fact that their hands are tied. Uh, to have an Olympic, a Winter Olympic Games at all, they will be in, in, in China or they will be nowhere. That's simply a practicality, right? And as I said before, Beijing only won by four votes over Kazakhstan for these games. 
I, I'm very sorry about that, right? Kazakhstan had its own human rights issues, but certainly could be uh, more uh, 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 likely uh, to improve uh, uh, and would have been the first Olympic Games held by a majority Muslim uh, culture and moreover one in which religious antagonism is quite minimal. So uh, Kazakhstan would have been a great uh, Olympic Games. The IOC played it safer because it was concerned about infrastructure. But Beijing only won. It was almost humiliated uh, to lose to Kazakhstan. Only won by four votes precisely because the IOC went through all of this with human rights in 2008. And no one, trust me, no one is under any illusion that the Olympic Games are going to make anything better with the, the human rights situation in China, whether that's the genocide or Hong Kong or suppression of journalists, uh, 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 et cetera. But most uh, IOC leaders, they really feel as a deep moral duty to have a games for the athletes. They're not going to cancel. And uh, they owe that to the athletes. And they have nowhere else to go. So we have to go to China. Now, what are we going to do, right? And uh, meanwhile, the whole NGO community, government after government, increasingly some of the National Olympic Committees are becoming vocal about this contradiction, right? We're for human rights, and we're going to have an Olympic Games in a country that's conducting a genocide against its own citizens, as we're playing games, as Mr. Xi is opening the games, and you're not going to say anything? Well, many of us are working to point out to the IOC and to the sport organizations that this hypocrisy cannot stand. You cannot have it both ways. And nobody is saying to you, we hold you responsible for stopping uh, the Communist Party's genocide. We know perfectly well the sport can't do that, right? Hell, the United Nations is hiding under the under the bed on this one because of Chinese veto in the Security Council and uh, power. Uh, even majority Muslim nations have been slow to condemn the genocide out of fear of Chinese economic and political uh, power. So no one is expecting that of poor sports organizations at the same time to think you could say silent, completely silent, and we're hoping that won't be the case in the end. Um, because uh, you fear losing, um, because China's over a barrel too. At this point, uh, the Chinese cannot, uh, Mr. Xi and the Chinese Communist Party can't cancel the Olympic Games either, right? So there's a power struggle going on. But were the IOC to continue in its present posture, uh, first of all, it would be going against its own history. It's very proud of the role it took uh, against South Africa because apartheid was not a political issue. It was a crime against humanity. That's what they said. That's what they proclaimed. So what we're saying back to them, tell us how genocide is not a crime against humanity. And tell us that if you're de-emphasized, it doesn't have to do with the fact that these are poor and largely, largely Muslim uh, uh, people who are, uh, are being destroyed. Um, so that's where the struggle is right now. Okay. Internet, David? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, David, do you have any parting words? No, I'll just say, you know, again, thank you. And hearing, uh, you know, John talk is really kind of bringing me back in a good way, kind of also a stressful way to, as I think all of you, you know, uh, in perspectives, <laughs> learning things that maybe I should have learned as an undergrad. Uh, and I was just wreck it real. I don't teach theory, but, you know, I'm in my uh, JMU office and literally I could go into that. I have filing cabinets in those closets and I still have my notes from perspectives. I still have the syllabi from perspectives. I still occasionally go back to, uh, I don't know, it's uh, it's so hearing John talk and hear him talk about, you know, sport, Olympics, the world, it, it's uh, it's really been fun. So uh, and, uh, so thank you. And uh Again, uh, thank you for the invitation, and uh, it's really great to see this strong alumni network for this program that was really so important for me. So, 
again, thank you. Uh, okay. Well, thank you both. And, you know, I, I feel the same way. Go ahead, John. Amanda, I have one final word since we pointed out that David has been mostly uh, studying masculinist uh, 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 situations and contexts of, of sport, immigrant sport. Nevertheless, I, I want to assure everybody that right now his entire passion his entire passion is with the extraordinary success of the James Madison women's softball team. That is the most important thing in and uh, most of sport going on right now. Right, David? The unranked. Uh, no, absolutely. There, it's an amazing uh, story, and hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, they take it all away. <laughs> all away. <laughs> well, good job. Um, John, I was afraid you were going to yell at me about my 80 page thesis that was supposed to be 40 pages and to get back there and edit it down a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for plotting through that with me. Um, <laughs> but it's been so nice to reconnect and actually have, you know, a, a real conversation. I, you know, David, I flash back to, to, you know, all those, all those, you know, amazing conversations and it was just so stimulating and it's it's so nice to be able to have these conversations almost in person and i'm hoping next time we all meet we can you know do it in person and raise a glass together and um yeah and this was wonderful thank you so much um and then our alumni association is going to be our our next step is to publish a newsletter since we all like writing so much <laughs> in the fall. So look for that. It'll be um, focused on lots of alumni stories from all over the world. So, so thank you again for, you know, preparing all of this and all the work that went into it. It's, it's not as easy as it looks and we've all learned a lot. <laughs> so thank you for, for doing this for us today and enjoy the rest of your alumni weekend. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, Sarah.